Welcome everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started. I'd like to thank everybody for coming to our innovation luncheon today. Our theme this year is improving healthcare through innovation, so it's right on topic. We have an excellent panel of speakers today, and we're looking forward to what they have to share with us. Um, first, I'd like to thank the program committee, chaired by Trish Godey and, and her, her team helping to get this luncheon organized today. Um, I'd like to turn the time over to Pimmy to give a, an update on our spring conference that's coming up. We're look, really looking forward to, to that. Welcome, everyone. Um, I'm so excited to be here today and uh, just to see the, the growth in our chapter. Um, my name is Pimmy Lopez. I'm the uh, 2016 conference chair, and I, I know that you started seeing announcements recently about it. We've had folks uh, registering for it. We, we've been at this for a number of months and putting together this program, and I, uh, I, I have the rare opportunity to uh, attend uh, other ch uh, chapter conferences uh, throughout the country, and in many other states that I've gone to, I've noticed that, that the... Um, State chapters really struggle to get uh, speakers to come out to their to their chapter chapter conferences, and and they'll usually ask me um, if I know of individuals that that they can ask as speakers. We don't have that challenge here in Utah, and you may many, many of you who've lived here for a long time may remember the store just in Murray that's just off the State Street and and uh, the 215 freeway. Allied Suppliers, I think, was the name of it. Do, do, does anyone remember that? Just seen it from the freeway. And they had they had a slogan. Does anyone remember what that slogan was? If if we don't have it, you don't need it. And and, and I can say that about our spring conference. We we just had so much local talent. And for me, this is a bit of an anniversary because this is my 10th conference, not, not with you, Hems, of course, but my 10th conference overall that, that I've chaired. And I always like to make them fun. I always like to make a little different. Uh, I had Kurt Bester perform one, one time. I had Stephen R. Covey as, as one of our keynote speakers. I even had the Mormon Tabernacle Choir present uh, or perform at, at one of our conferences. Uh, they're not performing at this conference, so, so don't, don't worry, uh, Kim. Um, we don't have enough room for them. So, so we really want to invite you to, to attend. We purposely kept the price low. And, and thanks to our sponsors, uh, we were able to, to do some things that we might not otherwise be able to do. But $99 for an early bird fee. And if there are any hardship situations, if we have a colleague who's in between jobs, we'll waive that fee. So we want to see you there, and please tell your your uh, your uh, coworkers, your your colleagues, and those that, that you uh, in the organizations that you work at about our uh, all about our conference because it is going to be very unique. We have phenomenal presenters, beginning with uh, Brent James. Uh, we have a panel uh, a panelist from class uh, research, and then we have a phenomenal luncheon uh, as well, too. And all the topics were carefully selected. So so thank you very much. I'll, I'll be on hand after our, our meeting today if you have any other questions for me. And I, I just want to say one last thing, too. Uh, and this is this is a tribute to our, our uh, president-elect, uh, and um, uh, Camille. When, when we started the the broadcast of, of our luncheons, there was a concern raised that that would impact the attendance at our at our luncheons, and we took a leap of faith that no, uh, we felt that individuals that wanted to be physically here would would, would still come, and and I think we've had we've had a, a, a very opposite effect, if anything, our attendance has grown at our luncheon presentations. And I, that is really a tribute to Trish, Camille, and those that serve on the uh, program committee. And I anticipate the same turnout at our spring conference. Thank you. Thanks, Pimmy. Yeah, b make sure to register um, early. The early registration ends on April 30th. And we're certain we're going to sell out. It will be an exceptional conference. 
Um, one thing to mention is we are looking, always looking for committee members to serve on our various committees and on the board. There are applications available at the table or if you'd like to speak with me after, we'd certainly love to have um, involvement from our members. Um, Another thing to think about is we're looking for organizational ambassadors at each of the companies that we work with to help get the word out about different programs and events we have with UHEM. So if you're interested in serving in that capa capacity at your organization, check with me after. Um, I'd like to turn the time over to Trish. She's going to introduce our, our panelists, and, um, and we're looking forward to what we have to share today. Thank you all for joining us. Um, this is an important, really an important luncheon for our membership. And what we, the, the UHIM's mission is really, you know, education and bringing quality education programs to our membership. And that actually includes our partner memberships in other states that have a lot of interest in what we're doing here in Utah. You know, to that end, the program committee really reserves this last this is one of our last programs of the year for the, this fiscal year, and we reserve it to allow our membership to participate and bring these innovative projects to the outstanding membership. Because as Pimmy has pointed out, we have a lot of really exciting things, smart people in the state of Utah. And so we'd like to be able to showcase that, in, and we use this for that. What happened this year, which was really interesting, is we had a lot of people submit their presentations and abstracts, very highly qualified. The caliber was unbelievable. And what we had to do is make a decision to only capture a couple of them, three, because you guys, aren't, you guys don't have all day to sit here, I'm sure. But what happened was we found out that we could build tracks so when the program committee had to go through all those submissions, what we did is we came up with a criteria for this particular innovation luncheon that would be focusing on health IT, the care team, and patients in some way or another. Next fall, I'm giving you a heads up that we are planning to do a real data HIT focused track as well as an interoperability track and potentially things like natural language processing and data management types of tracks. And I really want to encourage this membership to submit abstracts because they are, it's definitely out there. So I will be contacting all of you that submitted and some of you haven't on next year's program. Okay. Um, one of the things that I wanted to say is I want to reiterate that uh, we are going to have this program today. Our speakers have been, they put together these presentations. We're going to have three speakers. Uh, each speaker will be about 10 to 15 minutes. We're going to all uh, ask that you have a question and answer period following each speaker's presentation. We're going to limit that to about five minutes. And at the end of the day today, if we have time, we can field other additional questions if we didn't get to them. And with that, I will actually introduce our first speaker, uh, Nancy Sorensen. She will be presenting on a, the two-way integration between systems and the EHR and the, how that approach improves workflow, staff satisfaction, and patient experience. Nancy has 21 years of nursing experience in pediatrics and trauma, as well as medical legal consulting and project management in the field of medical informatics. Nancy is currently a senior clinical account manager with Bocera. I'll turn that over to you, Nancy. Thank you, Trish. I appreciate that. Um, let's see if we can get this to work here. That's okay. I'm just trying to make sure I do it right. <laughs> there we go. Okay, there's my, the start of my presentation. As Trish said, I have a background in nursing, um, senior clinical ma account manager for Vocera Communications. And for those of you who may not be familiar with Vocera Communications, we are a company that provides communication platforms for specific industries. A large part of our product is in the healthcare industry, but we're also in areas like hospitality, nuclear plants, things like that. I'm obviously going to focus more in healthcare for you guys today. Um, 
And what I want to share with you is an innovation project that we did with one of our customers, Santa Clara Valley Medical Center, with regard to their EHR, um, pointed mostly to, in fact, not mostly, completely to their EVS, or Environmental Services Group, within their hospital. And to give you a little bit of background about Santa Clara Valley Medical Center, they're in San Jose, California. It's a public teaching hospital affiliated with Stanford University. They're a designated level one trauma center and a safety net hospital. They handle more than 25,000 inpatient admissions and 800,000 outpatient and emergency visits every year. So they are a very, very busy place. Um, in fact, it is the busiest healthcare facility in the region and they serve the health needs of one in four residents in Santa Clara Valley, Santa Clara County. Give you a little bit of background about the problem they were having. After the introduction of the Affordable Care Act in March of 2010, as busy as Santa Clara Valley was, they became even busier. They increased their bed census almost overnight from 200 to 380 beds. And given their staffing levels and infrastructure, the hospital experienced far too many delays in patient admissions because of this huge boom in patient census. Wait times increased from when a patient was stabilized in the emergency department to when they were admitted into a hospital bed in the units. And as you can imagine, for any of you that have been in a hospital, that kind of wait adds a bunch of anxiety to what is already a stressful situation. So they decided they needed to do something about it. One of the things that was causing some of this stress was how their bed turnover happened. And for those of you who may not work in a hospital setting, bed turnover refers to how you get a bed ready for that next patient that's coming on board. And having to make that patient wait for that bed to be ready is, is not something hospital people want to have happen. The reason it can take a while is that cleaning a room for patient safety, can you've got to be careful about that. With all the infection capabilities and other things, you can't just empty a room and throw another patient into it. Um, initially at Santa Clara Valley, they had their EVS staff notified via pager when a room needed to be cleaned. Not very effective. Then they graduated when they brought Epic on to the health link component that was able to integrate with our communication systems, Vocera. And I should probably tell you a little bit more about the details of what Vocera is. Some of you may have been in some of the hospitals here in the Utah area that you see a little badge worn around your staff's necks. It's a hands-free communication device. We call that the badge. We also have a capability on hands-free devices, smartphones, where there's an application you can download. And both of these have the capacity for secured texting as well as voice communications throughout the hospital environment as well as outside the house hospital environment. And so what they were doing is EVS staff who were wearing their badge were being notified by EVS when a room needed to be cleaned. Um, then what had to happen is EVS had to stop, the staff member had to stop and go, find a computer, log into Epic, and mark whether or not that room was in the process of being cleaned or whether or not it was completed. Took a lot of steps and caused a lot of frustration for the EVS people. Um, it was very cumbersome for them. And the other part of this, because it was so cumbersome, is sometimes they wouldn't even do it. So then your nursing supervisor who's trying to figure out where is a bed for my next patient that I need to admit, couldn't tell without running up and down hallways and looking in rooms where a bed was that was available, whether or not it was in the process of being cleaned or whether or not it was ready for a patient. It ultimately added sometimes as much as eight to 10 hours of wait time for a patient who was in the ED, knowing they needed to be admitted to the hospital, they had to sit down there in ED on a gurney waiting for a bed to be opened. Not a happy situation. And so in light of this, well, the other added part to this is their EVS staff was very stressed. To have that bed turnover pressure on them was very hard. So they decided to launch an, an initiative to increase patient flow and hopefully maximize reimbursement. They made it a cross-functional team. They asked, um, Everybody involved, all kinds of caregivers, people in ancillary services, 
to step up and support and optimize efficiency to improve patient satisfaction. And they called this their improved day of discharge turnaround time. So as a part of this project, they pr proposed a solution of two-way integration between their electronic health record, which was EPIC, to Vocera, their communication system that would directly de relay that information to the staff members. Oh dear, we're off a little here. Poonam Airy is the Santa Clara Valley EVS manager, and she was very integral to this pro process. She said that for a patient waiting on a gurney in the ED, being transferred to a patient room even 30 minutes sooner makes a very positive impact. Once a patient is stabilized, the sooner we can make the exam room available for another patient, the better for everyone involved, so that those patients in the ED can be treated. They're not having to wait for a patient that's in a room to be sent up to a floor. Their goals for this were to reduce the turnaround time and also to be able to allow real-time visibility to nursing supervisors with regard to when beds were available for patients. So a little bit about the challenges and the timelines that we were dealing with. Santa Clara Valley really felt strongly about this initiative. They accelerated the time to deployment of this project largely due to the value that their leadership foresaw in this project. They started in February of 2014 and brought together Vocera and Epic and described their proposed solution. And for Epic and Vocera, they liked it. They thought, liked the idea, bought into it, but the problem was technology didn't exist yet to make this happen. So what this project required was that Epic had to create a new EVS web service. And for those of you who are Epic users and are familiar with open.epic, it is now on there. Vocera, for their part, had to build a two-way integration application geared to EVS. And for those of you in medical informatics, you know that building this kind of technology doesn't happen overnight. But they were able to work together and get it ready to start beta deployment by February of 2015. Beta went well enough that within just a few months, on May 19th, they went live and deployed in production. To give you a little background of how it works, what you see here on the side is our Vocera badge. This is a hands-free telecommunication device. And what happens when you have one patient discharged is the electronic health record automatically sends a message to the assigned EVS staff member, letting them know that a room needs to be cleaned. For instance, room 101 has a cleaning request. Also, it audibly enunciates, would you like to mark the room cleaning as in progress? So now that EVS staff member doesn't have to go run and find a computer and enter all the data in, they simply say, yes and it puts the information back into EPIC. And the beauty of this is that now that nursing supervisor can look and say, oh, room 101 is being cleaned. And they know what's going on. It's got a real-time application to it. Then, oops, I hope I didn't advance too fast. There we go. After a certain amount of time, and this is configurable based on your room. For instance, if you have an isolation room, that's going to take longer to clean than a regular patient room. You can determine, does, does this room need to be marked differently? And so the system actually automatically calls back to the, care, to the EVS staff member, and they receive a prompt saying, should I mark this cleaning as complete? And they can simply say yes. And as you can see, their hands can be busy. They can be involved in something and not have to even lift a finger to be able to make a response and have that go back into the EVS record. Thus, again, giving the nursing supervisors the ability to have real-time knowledge of when a room is ready for a patient to be admitted. To kind of go into the success factors that played into this and why it went so smoothly and we were able to be so successful was that, one, we had buy-in and support from senior management of all the three entities involved, Santa Clara Valley, Epic, and Vocera, as well as great teamwork between Epic and Vocera which doesn't always happen between vendors. Um, but in this case, everybody realized the advocacy for patient care that this um, innovation would make. We had strong project champions, too, at Santa Clara Valley in both EVS and IT as a part of that cross-functional team. And those champions were willing to allocate resources that were needed to get this moved up and expedited and eventually in the hands of their EVS staff. As a part of this, 
It required a staging environment as well as a production environment. They needed time to play in the sandbox and fix the bugs and figure out what was going to work, what wasn't, before they actually put it in front of the end users. A critical part of adoption is making sure your system actually works. Um, and they were able to do that in the staging environment as well as do end user acceptance testing. So that once it was ready, they could move it over to production and go live. And prior to doing that, they made sure that they trained the staff effectively. Again, you don't want to hand technology out without any instruction that helps them adopt it appropriately. So for more effective communication, it has also improved the overall work environment because staff were then able to perform their job-related activities with more ease. Since the implementation of this real-time communication, there was no more second guessing whether the system had been updated to reflect the what the beds were actually ready or not. Um, environmental services management and nursing supervisors no longer had to scramble from room to room or floor to floor to see which beds were available. And the result that they actually saw was a 50% improvement in bed turnover. That's a pretty significant improvement. They improved elements leading to decreased patient wait times in the ED. So a trickle-down effect, you get the rooms open in the units, the rooms in the ED open up faster and you can process more patients and get them in and get them treated. Nursing and EVS staff had real-time knowledge of what was going on with regard to cleaning in the, in the hospital and faster turnaround. Bottom line is that they expect to see revenue increases based on this as well as reduced waste and cost. And to just give you, <laughs> we're not advancing, there we go. Again, in Poonam's words, um, staff morale, this was one of the benefits that they did not expect, but staff morale actually improved substantially because environmental services did not have to waste a lot of time on administrative functions. They could get the rooms clean, do what they needed without having to play around with a computer. It also was seen as a win-win situation for everybody across the whole board, from senior leadership, frontline staff, as well as the patients themselves, which I think all of you agree that improving patient care is a primary objective for most all of us, even if we may not be directly touching a patient. And so with that, I would like to open up for questions. When a patient's ready for discharge, um, sometimes they don't automatically leave the room. They still kind of are hanging around. Someone Waiting for that drive home. <laughs> so I guess my question was, did they have to kind of standardize exactly when is the patient out of the room as opposed to when they're okay to discharge? Because that could be an hour, a couple hours between that time when they could start, they don't want to start pushing to clean the room if the patient's still in there. That's true, and they actually, I didn't get, don't have a lot of time to talk about the escalation and the finer points like that to get into, but it's built in with escalations where you can, that response from that staff member triggers things. It may go to a supervisor or it may go to another EVS staff member on the floor for, because you may also have your EVS staff member involved cleaning a room so they can't go clean that other room. All of that is actually built into escalation that's a part of the program. Unfortunately, I don't have the time to delve into those details, but it, that functionality is in there. And I guess that was part of your testing process to handle all of those kind of exceptional issues. Yeah. And, and the key to that is to be able to have it put back in the record, the EHR, so the nursing supervisors can see, oh, my patient's not actually out of the room yet, so of course they're not going to clean it. And instead of somebody having to go in and type that in, it's coming across through a verbal interaction and integration to the EHR. When they're asked about having, are they ready to clean this room or are they ready to say it is clean, is that what happens if they say no? Good question. I knew I was going to get that one. <laughs> that again is a part of that escalation path I talked about. Um, and that's variable. Um, different organizations can handle that differently. For Santa Clara Valley, my understanding is the way they do it is it directly goes to an EVS supervisor who can then determine, is this because somebody is not doing what they're supposed to? Is this because somebody's so slammed with work we need to get another staff member up there helping on that unit? 
what is the exact cause? And so they, that still, again, goes through so that people kind of can see in the electronic health record rather than running down to the room and saying, oh, the patient's still here. Oh, it didn't get clean because you're over in room 102 now. Things like that. That actually comes back with, through that integration. <laughs> and I'll be here after if you want to come back up, up after and we can, you can ask questions. Congratulations on the 50%. Have you had a chance to, or could you comment on the financial impact for the institution as a whole? I wanted that so much myself too. <laughs> Unfortunately, um, with Santa Clara Valley, they didn't have the foresight to do any pre-initiation evaluation to be able to say where they thought it was going to, to actually have documented information on that financial result. Um, it's more of an intuitive, you know, if we're getting patients in and out faster, there's obviously, a, you know, it's going to affect our bottom line. We're going to have better bed turnaround and better patient. But they don't have any hard numbers for me, unfortunately. Sorry. All right. Oh, and by the way, I did put our case study on the table. Um, if you guys want to take one of those with you, feel free. Thank you, Nancy. I appreciate that. Okay, uh, our next presentation topic is around telehealth technology and the newest in clinical support services. The topic will be co-presented by Catherine Repko and Lori Maddox. A little bit about uh, Catherine and Lori. Catherine serves as a manager in the clinical operations initiatives for Intermountain Healthcare's telehealth department. She's currently responsible for managing the development, implementation, and evaluation of Intermountain Telehealth projects, including stroke, infectious disease, uh, wound and pediatric ultrasound telementoring. Uh, Catherine completed her nursing informatics degree at the University of Maryland at Baltimore. Lori Maddox, glad you ladies could be here, thank you, um, serves as a clinical operations manager as well um, uh, with Catherine in the Intermountain Healthcare's telehealth department. She's er one of the early members of the telehealth team, lucky you, She's paving the way, definitely, and currently manages women and newborn telehealth projects and clinical protocols for the Enterprise Remote Patient Monitoring Program. Lori started her career in healthcare as a registered nurse, working at the variety of capacities from staff nurse to assistant professor of nursing. Uh, she's actually been uh, at Intermountain for a while, it looks like. You have a BSN <laughs> uh, from San Francisco State University and an MA in business from Bowie State. Presentation topic, telehealth technology, a new clinical support service, and with that I will let you guys take it on. Thank you, Trish, and thanks for coming out today, guys. Mm -hmm. Um, so we first want to start as good nurses with our learning objectives. <laughs> hey. We really want to um, help you learn and understand um, why we chose to implement a, a single solution. Um, we want to show you how that supports Intermountain across all of our clinical programs. And we want to show you a little bit of show and tell. So we have some nice pics and want to tell you our success stories. So the show and tell is always the most fun. Mm -hmm. So let's see, how do we? Go here. Okay, so when we think of telehealth technologies, we're, we really are still facing many of the same barriers to implementation that I'm sure you all have experienced in your health IT initiatives. You know, we, um, in our case, it's some of the maturity of the audio video technology that's available. You know, there's a lot out there, but how do you really get this to connect and talk to one another? Uh, there's a lot of different proprietary software that you have to deal with, and none of us deal with that interoperability issue here. I know that's strange, but no, we, we have to face that as well. Um, the cost, this is a huge upfront investment, uh, as I know most of our technologies are, and, and Intermountain has had to, you know, to make that commitment to, to invest in telehealth technology. As you can imagine, the infrastructure, the IS maintenance, this doesn't come free. Just because we install it doesn't mean that it works every time. In fact, 
Uh, that's a, a big challenge we have to overcome. And of course, it's all about the people, process, and technology. This impacts everybody's clinical workflows so that we, as we introduce this new technology, I'm fundamentally changing some of the workflows of the clinicians at the bedside. And always we have to measure to improve our clinical outcomes, you know, it's cost, quality, and outcomes, right? And so how am I impacting clinical care? So with this, we you know, sat back and as uh, Trish said, I'm one of the early members of the team. So kind of back in 2013, we really took, uh, I will say there's a lot of really smart people in the room and I was not one of the smart people, I was a note taker. Um, but no, we really sat down and said, what is it gonna take to, to develop a, uh, a technology that's gonna support us? And I remember talking to, um, to the team and saying, you know, we're fundamentally going to be delivering the new service line. This is, you know, like uh, HIE is done, HIMSS is done. We're fundamentally developing a new way of delivering healthcare services to the patients, and that's pretty exciting. So we had to, like, good, like any good. Uh, project teams. We sit down and do a build versus buy. We looked at a lot of the different software solutions that were out there. Many of them were really targeted to certain clinical focus. And, and while those are good, they also had, you know, their advantages and disadvantages. We, you know, there's some definite examples out in the marketplace that I'm sure you're familiar with, like Philips EICU is a leader in telecritical care medicine. It all, you know, it has strengths, it has weaknesses, as they all do. We had to look at the video technology. Uh, which is going to be, you know, there's a lot of different uh, video technologies around and which one are we going to use? How are we going to put this together? How are we going to take this hardware and bring it together? What we did, we started in 2013, we put together some co clinical computers as well as in-room computers, used, even used Logitech webcams, little tiny webcams in certain solutions. Um, we've evolved over the years, and maybe you can go to the next slide, and we'll show, we really took off-the-shelf technologies. We did not take any new technology. We took off-the-shelf technologies, the best, uh, as our technologist Lonnie would say, the best of breed it, during the time, and put, pulled it together to say how could we how could we make this platform work? Some of these things have changed. We had the XI3, the big blue box in the. Uh, we started with those. Those no longer. Um, being supported as well, manufactured, quite honestly. So we've had to go to the Nook. We started with some Link. Now it's now Skype for Business. So over the last three years, we've really had to keep up with the market. And I continue to rely on our technology team, which is awesome, I will say, to really bring us the best new technology that we can bring to our telehealth technologies. So you can understand that all the barriers that Lori described, if we had purchased a different system for each different service, how much that would multiply in our management of those systems. So we really looked at um, developing our single technology platform, and this platform then um, was able to support a broad range of any clinical program. So, um, for example, today, um, I, Vanessa was telling me, Michelle, that um, she went to visit a hospital in Ohio, and they had one system for their um, tele-ICU, and they had a different system for their stroke. So if they're in the ED, there's like, oh, it's a stroke, I have to go get the cart. Oh, it's this, I have to go get that. So what our goal was really to just have one system, it's easier for training, um, and all of that. So we had the luxury of a dedicated development team, which was awesome. Um, and then we also, we built a single wrapper that we then have one standard training. We teach all of our different users from the neonatologist to the neurologist to our telecritical care nurses one tool. And it makes it so much easier to support. But even though it's easy in one platform to support, we found that we needed to embed it in our various support teams so that it would be scalable to go across all of our facilities. You know, I, Catherine, can't be able to answer every neurologist when they have a problem. So we needed to be able to educate our support teams and scale this across for maintenance and support. Um, and then I wanted to say our first go live was telecritical care yeah. um, at, at Park City in their ICU. So 
and that was back in 2013. Yeah, December 2013. We were <laughs> sitting there kind of installing it ourselves. So since that time, so it's been pretty excited because we took this fundamental, um, identified the hardware, the software, and said, how, now we're going to put this in all of our, our first strategy was crisis care. And we are going to start and go ahead and, um, or crit, uh, sorry, critical care. And we're going to install in all of our ICU rooms. That was one of our first, we call these our big four projects, but we started with telecritical care. We now have over 260 beds in our 12 hospitals being proactively monitored by a 24-7 dedicated telecritical care station with nurses and physicians on site. And we have some representatives here if you want questions about that. Pretty exciting stuff. They have an average daily sense of 160 to 170 patients. Um, and we've actually now gone live outside of Intermountain Walls, if you will, with our critical care and supporting a hospital in Star Valley. So it's pretty exciting, I think. Um, then while in parallel, so in parallel to the adult care, because there's you know, in, intensive care medicine and I'll have other people speak to some of the numbers or you'll have to come back to the spring conference to hear more. Mm -hmm. But um, in addition to the adult care, in parallel, I was working on the what we call the newborn critical care team. Because as you know, we have a lot of small hospitals that don't have neology neonatologist there. Uh, and so similar to leveraging the skill set of the specialist in the ICU, what we decided to do is have neo neonatologists be able to support all of our fragile babies born at our outlying hospitals. And so we started with that. I now have all the facilities. We have four support facilities. Every hospital has telecritical care support in the C-section ORs, the nurseries, and most all the rooms so that neonatologists can be at the bedside just as quickly as possible. We've avoided 31 transfers, and these are super conservative numbers for about a half a million dollars in savings in just avoiding the transport cost alone. And I won't even go into the ripple of savings that that means to the patients and families. So when I joined the team in 2014, Lori was, had done critical care and was doing the neonatal and was also trying to start up stroke. So <laughs> I got stroke, and it was really delightful. Um, we now have that live. The neurohospitalists from Intermountain Medical Center here support all of our facilities across the organization. So we have 17 hospitals, and we've stood up our equipment in the emergency department. We've used our transfer center as that standard call in. And um, we've seen 357 patients as of early this week. <laughs> um, and we've given TPA to 64 of those, which is really phenomenal. That rate is so much higher. Now, it is a pre-selected group, if you will, because the ED doctor says, oh, it looks like telestroke would be really helpful for this patient. So they um, will call us. But we encourage them to call us all the time, um, as often and as frequently as possible. Um, and then, you know, the standard, the gold standard for giving TPA to patients is under is 60 minutes, and we are now below that across our entire organization. So that's a huge win. We're very excited about that. And our um, neurologist response time, um, and I think, Trish, one of our um, data managers had put in a whole poster that she wanted to show, too. We'll have to do that at a future. But our response time is under four minutes, and that's the ED calling the transfer center, transfer center, paging the neurologist wherever they may be 24-7 um, and getting that neurologist in touch with the ED doctor. So it's pretty cool. Um, and then crisis care. So um, our colleague Jason Cox does crisis care. We are live at 11 hospitals and they've done to date 332 evaluations. Um, they're staffed 24-7. You know, if you think of it, your patient that's out in one of our rurals that comes in with a crisis, they have to be evaluated. And if you have to wait for your counselor to physically go to that facility, that's a real delay in care. So it's very exciting. They're supported out of LDS hospitals. The social workers are there. And then they support across the organization. Um, and huge savings to this point. Okay. So here's our show and tell because the pictures are much more fun. So this is an example of our uh, telecritical care. And we, you can see in the, 
in the, with Michelle in the patient's room. We have our uh, LG Kim TV and uh, Dr. Clummer there as uh, the intensivist coming into the room. And then Vanessa, you may have seen our commercials, but there's Vanessa behind the agent workstation. So of course, we always have our originating distance site. You get to learn all this nomenclature and telehealth, but you have to have, you know, the, the Vanessa represents that clinician who is in the seat providing that dedicated care out to our different uh, intensive medicine rooms, our different ICU rooms. And then we have um, the newborn. So the newborn, what uh, was really fun about that, I said we started with the webcam. So we put in this really high-end, high-fidelity equipment for the adults, spent a lot of time and a lot of research on um, getting that adult solution defined. We recognized we had to come up with the hardware and the software platform. And in the meantime, my neonatologists are saying, just give me a webcam. I just have a tiny baby, so I need a little webcam. And we used a little webcam, and we used Link, and we made it work. And, and But you can imagine all the challenges with just using this little webcam hooked on the end of the warmer. So what we did, and this is really cool in that we worked iteratively with the uh, clinical staff, the physicians, the nurses, the technology team, the platform infrastructure, and on the left there you can see what we finally ended up. My camera now is that little, I have the red arrow pointing to it. It's a mini access camera. It's the same little baby version of what we use in the adult room, and now it, it really meets the workflow of the staff at the bedside. Okay. So I've been working with the pediatric radiologists also. They said, gee, we um, staff out at River 10, but we're there 9 to 5 business hours. And we have a lot of um, pediatric appendix patients come in through the ED at night. And our sonographers there, I didn't know this, but they don't learn to do pediatric appendix studies in school. And so it's really a learned skill. So we have... Um, we said, oh, we can help you. <laughs> we, have, we said we don't have our whole platform. Again, we're using Link. And you can see there that we had a little laptop to the left, and we asked the sonographer to learn to use Link and stood up the entire protocol where they would page the pediatric radiologist. They would log on to Link, and then the sonographer would call them. And you can see now they have a semi-private conversation. Before we did this, they were juggling the phone on their shoulder and trying to talk to them and trying to do something. So it streamlined them that way. And again, you can see the little um, baby webcam that's on the sonography, on the ultrasound machine too. So that was the initial thing. And then here's what this, the um, radiologist sees on the other end, he actually, we stream the ultrasound, so he can say, no, turn your hand just a little bit, go long, do this, a little bit differently, and he can see the results because it's real-time streaming. And he can see the room, he can see the patient, he can see the sonographer, he can see how stressed they are, what the family is doing, you know, and they don't really want to talk to the family or the patient, but they're happy to see everything. And then we are again iterating through this. Here's the next version. So it's a little bit cleaner. We're using an all-in-one. And rather than have a separate camera, we just are using the camera that's in the all-in-one. And we have given the um, sonographers wireless headsets so they have a little bit less to deal with. So it's just, again, the progression of the same platform, the same software, but using somewhat different tools based on the scenario and the service. So I think that's it. Oh, no, one more. So this is where we are today. So taking that basic uh, telehealth platform, the different hardware that we defined, working with our clinical programs and our clinical services and users at the front line uh, who are constantly telling us, hey, we can do this, we can do that. And this is what we have installed in our active programs that we're supporting today. So thank you. Like technology like that is actually even further removing um, providers from patients. What is your position on that? 
So I'll tell you a story, um, and I this to me was very heartfelt. You know, with newborn resuscitation, so we have the doctors come in and have to resuscitate babies at times. You know, and these are very difficult situation. Um, we had an experience where there was, you know, an unfortunate outcome. The neonatologist was on the call, you know, in the community hospital, helping that family and really working with the staff at the bedside to do everything they could for that family. And this, and so when the baby transitioned over to the NICU, and the father came with the baby. The father said to the doctor, he said, I know you, you've been working on my baby the last few hours. And so that soft handoff between the having that face, having that supportive care at the bedside was really profound for that family. And I, and I know, you know, kind of there's always that initial resistance, and I won't say there's not. It also has the ability to really com connect people and bridge some of those gaps and barriers. And I even see that in the building of the trust and the relationships between the specialist and the community hospitals that we're serving. And, and so, I'd like to echo that from stroke. I mean, as um, the patients, we have an example of a patient up at Ogden who had a stroke at home. Luckily, his family recognized it. The EMS called ahead to the ED. We had the neurologist on the TV as part of the team when the patient arrived. That patient had TPA in 20 minutes after arrival. It was amazing. So we really feel like rather than be removed, we bring in more specialists and they can participate in that patient care. And so with the increasing amount of surveillance that we have just as the Internet of Things, and so how do you, um, I don't know, how it feels like they're being even more so surveilled now than before. And we've had patients express that concern. Um, and we did not show in there, but there's a little light that we put on our, our system right under the TV that lets you know when the camera's on. And it's really, we educate our staff to tell the patient, you'll see this when the, pa when the camera's on, otherwise it's off. So it's a very clear indicator when somebody is looking into the room. And so can they opt out of that service, just in general, the telehealth service itself? I actually, I mean, if they truly put up a barrier, they could. We, It is part of the consent to treat when they enter the hospital. Um, it is part of the consent to treat. And it would be, it'd be like saying, I don't want that neurologist to come see me when I'm having a stroke, or I don't want that neonatologist to help my baby. I mean, I guess I could, but I'm probably, probably not going to. <laughs> so, but those okay. are, I will say, and, and just, at the very beginning, um, and it still is a barrier, but I think we, initially there was a lot of concern around surveillance, around and having cameras in the room, and now it is um, more perceived as a support and phone a friend and let's get that extra resource here. It is a big learning curve though for people to get comfortable with being on both sides of the camera. Right, exactly. Okay, we're going to hold that question, Ben, and we're going to move to the next speaker. Thank you. Thanks. Yes, thank you very much. Um, go ahead, Matt, sorry. Oh my gosh, good thing I have my glasses on. Uh, yes, thank you, Lori and Catherine. And by the way, we'll, there'll be time for questions, I'm sure, after. So Ben's got one in the back there for you. Okay, my, our next speaker uh, is. Dr. Matt Hoffman, he's the Chief Medical Informatics Officer at the Utah Health Information Network, uh, Utah's designated health information exchange. I'm glad I have my glasses on, Matt. As CMIO, <laughs> I can't even see it. <laughs> Sorry, it's that 10 font. Yeah, it's that 10 font. At CMIO, he supervises all products around clinical health information exchange at UHAN, including Thank you. <laughs> I have my glasses on. I, I was having a hard time reading that. Let me, let me just start in the middle. I got most of it right. Um, 
So basically, CMIOE supervises all products around clinical health information exchange at UHAN, including their data warehouse, MPI, direct alerts, and analytics. That's great. Through the use of these products at UHAN, he's able to assist their community with public health reporting, analytics, transition of care, HADIS reporting, RAPS file creation, and many more. Dr. Hoffman also sits on multiple national committees covering issues around health information exchange, interoperability, it's a good one, and information governments. I'll turn it over to him now. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you. Will do. Okay, I'm going to get this. Make sure I'm sharing my screen for the web, and then let's pull this up. Yay, okay, it worked, fabulous. We're 90% of the way there. <laughs> All right, so when I first sent in our abstract, uh, we were planning on talking about some of the things that we've been able to do with our electronic notification service and with some of our readmission analytics and our admission analytics, but I thought it'd be beneficial to expand that a little bit and talk about some of the other things that we're doing with the CHI. Um, just as a quick poll, how many of you have heard of the CHI for, for Utah? for the state, okay. So um, just to, to point out that the uh, rumors of the death of the Chi have been greatly exaggerated, that, that we are still there, we're still plugging forward and things are moving forward quickly. Um, we had to switch over systems because we felt like some of the things with our old vendor were inhibiting us a little bit, but since move, making that move and bringing more things in-house, we've been able to advance very quickly and we're very excited about that. So today I'm gonna briefly go over the Chi, where we're at currently. Um, and then talk about some of the things that we've been able to do once we've been able to bring all of this data together. Um, so these are all of the data sources. We have 70 different data sources and almost 200 different data feeds from around the community and also parts of Wyoming and parts of southern Idaho that push information in. This information, these data sources here, this does not include the VA, this does not include Intermountain, and this does uh, not include some of the other hospitals that are connected to the CHI, but are not pushing information to the CHI. We have set up with the IHE protocols and are pulling information in for those different data sources. So these data sources here are different institutions that are pushing clinical information that is not only viewable in the CHI, but also goes into a data uh, warehouse for the state as a whole that can leverage some of these different tools that we've developed. So here's a, just a quick high level view of the architecture of the CHI. So you can see that we have um, our different data sources that are pushing in. We have a router that we have an initiate uh, MPI that enables us to sort out some of these identities uh, from all these different data sources. And then that information, if you look at the uh, bottom right, uh, you can see that that information goes into a data warehouse. The query portal users up at the, bot, bot, at the top right, sorry, and in the middle right, the eHealth Exchange, um, those are the ones that are querying our system and pulling that information across, and we also have the ability to pull their information across via query. These are typically CCD or CDA information. It's not the whole complete picture like we're getting from the pushes. From these data sources that are pushing information via an HL7 message, we're getting all the transcription reports, which include admit, discharge summaries, operation reports, clinic visits, all of that information. Um, and then we use that, we use natural language processing and regular expressions to grab those big blobs of data and structure that data in a way that we can begin to do some analytics on it. We also get lab feeds, admission, discharge, transfer summaries, and uh, notifications, um, and then radiology reports. <clears throat> so then once we take that information that's in a structured format in our data warehouse, we can begin to do some of these analytics analyses on it. Uh, one of the most exciting ones that we have with these analytics is based around our ENS system, which is a notification service where a payer or a physician, a case manager can subscribe to a list of patients, and if that patient is seen anywhere in a hospital in the state, then they will receive a notification that that patient is being seen. 
that can allow them to reach out to that patient either at discharge, make sure that a visit is scheduled and bring them in and see that patient, or it can allow them to uh, come in and do an intervention. For example, we have um, some behavioral health providers that are connected and receiving alerts on their patients. That allows them to phone up the emergency department and say, hey, we'd like to have a conversation about this patient, or to send in one of their case managers if they're close enough to go in and meet with that patient before they get admitted to the hospital, possibly schedule a visit and, and circumvent a whole admission process, allow them to prevent that cost to the system as a whole. So this, I saw this chart a few months ago in an analytics uh, seminar and I thought it was very interesting. And we have really focused our emphasis on sort of the bottom of the analytics tools there. You can see that the value is off to the, to the bottom on the x-axis and the cost to the users and the cost for infrastructure is on the y-axis. You can see that there is a steep co uh, curve um, as you move from the analytic tools to the query uh, mediation. And so the analytic tools is those tools that are in place for people to do their own analyses, whereas the query mediation and the domain analyst are where you're getting high cost with uh, human resource costs and getting experts to build some of these queries. And there's a steep curve there with very little value gained. And so we feel like we've our role to help the community is to develop some of these analytic tools that people can get their hands on and do some of these analyses where it's a good price point for the community and we get a, still a substantial amount of value from those tools. So I'm going to pop over here and show you some, some of the tools that we've been able to develop here. Um, here we go. So these are some of the case management tools that we've been able to develop. So what these are, this is a pull of information from the community as a whole, from all those clinics that are connected, all those hospitals that are connected. We get a list of patients from the physician and we pull in information from their EHR and then we complement that information with all the information from the community. And so they get a complete picture, not only just to sort of see a patient's summary of what's going on with the patient, but now the ability to analyze what's going on with their patient as a whole. And so you can see that these, have been, these charts have been created by physicians and with physician input. And you can see that they've been able to do some hot mapping here for the hemoglobin A1C versus age. And you can see some of these hot spot relationships with that information. Um, we've been able to look at hemoglobin A1Cs. You can't see it very well. Uh, but you can see there's a, a line right here. There's a grouping here where we have these patients that have, that have been, um, their, hem their hemoglobin A1C is under better control and their microalbumin is under better control, whereas these younger patients are sort of still figuring things out. Um, this is one that we've really developed around case managers and the ability to, for a case manager to do analytics on the fly and create a working list of the patients that they need to reach out to. So you can see that this is all web-based and this is something that we can filter on a patient population that only those case managers have a right to see. And they can do this and they can highlight these high-risk patients here that have a high BMI and a high cholesterol and then everything changes on the fly and now they have their working list here of those patients that they can reach out to. And we have also been able to bring in some of the geoanalytics tools that are available with this software. And you can see that here is the uh, state of Utah broken down by county. Each one of these dots represents a zip code and each color dot is the average hemoglobin A1C at the, for that zip code. So you can see that there are certain zip codes that need to be reached out to. This allows either epidemiologically to reach out or even marketing to say, wow, let's do a campaign, reach out to this area and say, let's get better control of our diabetes or something to that effect. So this is our, our admissions and our readmissions dashboard that we've created for some of the hospitals and some of the case managers. You can see here that this chart here is the number of admissions that we've gotten based off of that specific diagnosis. And so abdominal pain is the highest. And here down in this corner, you can see that these are the emergency room visits, uh, the inpatient visits and the outpatient visits, and then those same broken down by month. And then this is all filterable on the fly. So I can put in abdominal pain here if I can spell, and everything changes on the fly. And then you can see here, here are my uh, most frequent users of the systems, the different types of admissions that they've done. And then I can click on this and I can see an entire 
uh, all the different reasons that that patient has come in and all the information about that patient, along with the ability to reach out to that patient and have a conversation with them or schedule an appointment with them and bring them in. Uh, the last one that we've done here. Um, so this is around a specific NQF measure as part of the USIMS grant. Um, we've been working on a few different um, NQF measures around obesity and diabetes. And we've also looped in some of the asthma measurements also. And so here you can see that here is the numerator and the denominator broken down by month. For this specific group of patients, here is their percentage. You can see the numerator and the denominator. And then all of this you can change uh, on the fly here. And so as, as I change my date of service, for example, you can see that everything changes automatically on the fly. And then I can select one of these here. And then I have my, once again, I have my working list. I can see how that specific information is carried over to different charts and how those numbers change. And so this really presents a very powerful tool for a very, very small price point for clinicians, for smaller um, payers. Uh, that allows them to have these tools at their disposal. We can bring in different data sources in a federated way, combine it with data from the community, and allows them to get a complete picture of what's going on with their patient population, and then tools of how to work with these patients automatically and begin to make all of this data actionable. Something we're very excited about. So I'm a little bit over, so uh, thank you for your time. Any questions? Please. So if the, if the provider is connected, um, then we can just pull that information from the, the information that they're sending to the CHI. If they're not connected, then we can grab a, pa a patient registry list from them and we work with them to pull that information over from their system. If they want to uh, combine the information they have in their system, we can connect with their system directly in various means, either through standards like HL7, X12, or whatever it may be, or we can do an o ODBC connection. And then we combine that with all the information around that specific group of patients with all the information from the whole community and push it back into their uh, data cube that's restricted for these analytics tools. Um, typically, the cost is, is just included in the, the CHI membership of, for, for the community. Um, and that, I can't, it's, it's in the hundreds of dollars annually. It's not substantial. Uh, any other questions? Yes, please. So we've gotten a much higher um, adoption by the payers. There's a real dearth of, of clinical information um, and the, the means to get that information from the hospitals and the clinics to the payers um, without the use of going through the HIE is you're building multiple connections and thousands upon thousands of dollars to do those or you're doing things via fax or through bulk loads of information. Um, and so the payers see a substantial value that they can pull this in in a single connection and then have the tools available to begin to look at that data and analyze that data. Um, we, other than that, we have some of the more forward-thinking clinics that are in the community. I think we have three or four that are um, getting very excited about using these tools and have started using these tools. Uh, please. We're, that we're working on the benchmarking component of things um, currently. Um, so because of the way that we're exchanging information with one of the largest healthcare providers in the state, um, the benchmarking tool isn't quite as valuable, um, but data warehousing in a federated way is greatly advanced in the last couple of years. And then also the ability to exchange information through some of the IHC protocols is really advanced also. And so we feel like we're on the cusp of that, the ability to use, to get some sort of uh, community-wide bench benchmarking. Please. You know it's coming, right? I'm gonna ask you about privacy. So, yes. um, just me being a patient myself, knowing that you guys are collecting this, I actually didn't know this. 
Uh -huh. And so can people opt out of it and how are you protecting their privacy? Yeah, absolutely. Opting out is, is um, a big thing for us. Um, it's, we, have the, we even have a website where you can go in and just do everything digitally from, from where you are to opt out and give your consent to share or not to share. Um, and that's why we're also very strict about making sure that we've got the attribution of the patient to the physician very accurate and so that we can lock down that information so a physician can't see information for patients that they um, don't have a right to see that information. And that's the same with any payers, that they're only able to access information for patients for whom they've paid for those services. Yes. So in 10 years, I have um, changed healthcare providers about five times. Right. I left the military. Uh, I had to get into the VA system. I had private insurance taking care of some things, and then I switched jobs a couple of times. In all that time, I would like to have seen a button that says, opt me and do all of it. Right. Uh, it would be really nice if my VA doctors had access to this and that and the other, and I didn't have to go in for a whole series of new appointments and checkouts every time. Exactly. Um, who can I, what can I do to, to opt in? I mean, I don't, I don't know if all the programs who participate in this give me the option to do that. Yeah, so the VA is the one distinction where you have to still opt in when you go to the VA. Um, but a few years ago, the, the state legislature passed legislation passed a rule for all Medicaid patients and for all state employees that they were going to be opted in, and if they chose to opt out, then they would have to opt out of that process. The percentage of opt out was, I think, a six tenths of one percent of patients that actually opted out, um, and that was after massive mailings, massive phone calls, the setting up the system, the ability to do it via web-based, and so the community came together, and that, along with the development of the ability to query information instead of pushing information freed up the hands and the community decided as a whole that the opt-out model would be much more efficient for the community um, and spoke with different privacy groups from the state. And so we've moved from an opt-out model. So that information is now available uh, to be used by physicians um, except for those individuals who choose to opt out. As a, as a follow-up then, um, how would my my primary care physician at my family provider know that that information is available? Um, so we've tried to reach out and be um, as aggressive as possible with getting physicians increasing the knowledge that this information is available through the CHI. The big hurdle is that physicians don't want to leave their EHR and sort of have to then log into another system. And so we're working very aggressively to integrate with all the different EHRs possible, either through a push from the CHI to the EHR, so it's integrated directly with theirs and their analytics tools, or through this query exchange where they can pull a patient summary over from the CHI directly into their EHR and view all that information. And so we're trying to make those connections and try to improve that awareness, make it easier. But a big step forward has been really the addition of the Intermountain data, which has happened in the last few months. That's been a huge step forward. and once that information spreads, then physicians are much more likely to adopt this, to, this way of accessing that information. Please. Um, yeah, so we can have a whole long conversation about how the different tools that we use for identity management. Uh, there is a big, so we use Initiate. We looked at multiple different um, pro, uh, products and we really felt like Initiate was one of the best in the market. In fact, that's one of the main reasons we changed our whole platform to have the tools that were there and to have those matching algorithms. And so we had these feeds come in from all these different data sources, run them through our algorithms, then we check over them manually, and then we subscribe to two national databases that have track identity based off of financial information and all sorts of other different data points, and we review those manually, those ones that are sort of quirky or a little bit too close to call. And so we do all of that proactively. And there's a big push right now to, to come together and find a way to have a, some sort of identity management service, which is statewide, that really helps in getting that identity matching very, very accurate. Great, thank you.
Okay, some closing remarks. I'd like to really give a hand to all of our speakers and thank you for participating in this session. And I also want to remind everyone that we have the spring conference coming up and to register. Get in there before you, well, you can. Thanks for attending. Have a great rest of the day.